Good morning. Um, I'm aware that there's not a lot of folks here. There's also a camera, cameras over there. I want to talk about something I've been doing a lot in my clinic. I was asked to introduce the idea of intermittent fasting or the various fasting regimens in the primary care setting. I was trying to figure out what's the best way to possibly do this. You figure the most likely way this is going to be introduced is in a chronic disease, right? There's a whole lot of reasons to do something like a fast, but in our type of line of work, right, in family medicine, it's most likely going to be obesity, diabetes, hypertension, etc. So I figured that would be the most appropriate entry point, and we can kind of branch out from there. So I figured the best way to do that with the hour we have is to introduce and discuss briefly metabolic uh, syndrome. We're not going to dwell too much on it. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Once metabolic syndrome is outlined, since that's the primary thing we're going to do uh, clinically, I'll introduce how the idea of a fast fits into the treatment of this disease process. From there, we'll go through the evidence, and we'll talk about some practical stuff. I paste this so that there'll be time for questions. Um, if there are, great. If not, I can always talk more. They gave me an hour, so I guess captive audience. So let's have fun. Unless the virtual guys can always just, you know, make coffee or something or walk away. I won't be offended if y'all make coffee. It's all right. So metabolic disease. Let's go from there. What is metabolic syndrome? That's the star of the show for this uh, portion. Basically, once upon a time, we had this idea that, uh, how do you say it? Once upon a time, we realized that insulin, no, rather, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, sometimes liver disease, sometimes thyroid things, sometimes gout, clustered together in a meaningful way. We weren't quite sure what that was. But then we realized over time, hey, there might be a common factor. The question was, what is that common factor? We called it syndrome X. And then fast forward to roughly 1988, this guy goes, hey, it might be insulin. That was uh, Dr. Gerald, Gerald? Reven, um, in, a, in a Banting lecture, which takes, took some notoriety for being one of the first ones to kind of conceptualize it that way. The question was, was that accurate? So what ended up happening from there was, the idea was more accurate than we thought. His idea was, hey, this might be a disease of insulin. That was 1988. Fast forward, and we find out that, yeah, insulin is at the core of the problem, but it's not the only problem. Ooh, let's use the pointer. There you go. So what ended up happening was he found out that two inputs, being overfed and underactive, stuff that we talk about constantly in our jobs, led to insulin resistance and inflammation. Those are the two main ones. And that these two phenomena drive the subsequent issues as such. You guys know glycation because all, we all take hemoglobin A1Cs. Oxidative stress is the cortisol thing slash just the price of doing business as a body. Membrane instability is what happens to our cells as they take on this cellular damage, so on and so forth. But basically, the, the engine that drove the thing was essentially this inflammation resistance pattern. What ended up happening from there was we realized that, oh, there it is. Clinically speaking, if the patient has significant central obesity plus two of the four factors, it's a very high likelihood that they're gonna have this, right? You take somebody with central obesity, that means that what? They're not just that they're overweight or obese, but it's in that apple distribution we tend to talk about, right? Um, and then they have, what, hypertension, dyslipidemia, whether that's the trigs being up, the HDL being down, uh, glucose being out of whack, so on and so forth, or a pathology that signifies significant disease. For example, like, let's say we take somebody with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I don't care about the other criteria as much. Because they have NAFLD, they de facto have this anyway, right? Or we take those patients with these more, uh, like, research-based criteria, right? We actually see the fat in the viscera. We see the metabolic derangement, so on and so forth. We can say that these people have that kind of problem. Then the question became, does it matter? Is this just a fancy way of just rebranding the same obesity conversation, or is there a difference to it? This is one of my favorite slides that my med students honestly hate. Like, they don't like math. They're, they're doctors to be. They're not... Anyway, but the idea is I wanted to use this slide to map out something very important where I put these arrows, one, two, three, and four, five. Virtual folks, you can't see where I'm putting the pointer, but guess what? There's arrows. That's for you. If you look at the normal weight, no metabolic syndrome uh, population in the bottom left, right, the reference side, and compare that to these others. Notice be, just being overweight, just being obese doesn't seem to cause that much of a problem, right? If we look at all cause versus cardiovascular, yeah, it affects cancer mortality for sure. But for the cardiac perspective, from the all-cause, the difference isn't as big as you would anticipate given what we say. That being said, you take the normal weight with metabolic disease, that's the, uh, the highest uh, uh, row on the left side, the one goes to a 1.7. What does that mean? That's a 70% increase in the relative risk right, of uh, some sort of all-cause mortality event within the time interval. And this study was about 10 years. What ends up happening is if we take the same obesity thing, 
The obesity doesn't necessarily cause that, but metabolic disease does. When you factor it all together, what you see is that the obesity is very closely linked to having a lot of these pathologies, the heart disease, the, uh, the cancer mortality, so on and so forth. But it's not necessarily the thing that does it, but it's tightly knit to it. It looks like the thing that actually kills you is the metabolic derangements that are part of the obese scenario, as in you can be metabolically compromised but not obese. But you could also be obese and not metabolically compromised, and that's a really cool thing to make note. The question is, how does that happen? So, um, before anybody gets palpitations, too much coffee, um, we're going to talk about one common pathway. That's the DAG, DAG, IP3PKC pathway. I, I'm aware that most of us have not touched biochem since undergrad. Don't worry about it. We'll be okay. Um, this pathway occurs in three different systems. That's the muscle, the muscle, the liver, and the adipose. And by driving this pathway into these three organ systems, you end up with the metabolic derangements that we'll be concerned with for the next two-thirds of this lecture. What is the DAG IP3 PKC pathway? I don't expect you guys to ask. Uh, no, I can't ask you guys questions. Nobody has a mic. Never mind. I'll just talk about the answers. Basically, what happens is whenever you eat something, I don't care what it is, you make ATP eventually, right? Carbs, fat, protein doesn't really make a difference. What ends up happening is at some point, you turn that into some sort of fuel metabolite, eventually ATP. One day, you have enough ATP, right? You're fed. You're satisfied. What happens to the excess? The excess siphons back into what? The glycolytic pathway, the protein recycling pathway, so on and so forth. What ends up happening is as you have enough fuel, the excess energy builds up in the cell. That buildup in the cell needs to be handled some way, otherwise it'll do some bad stuff. Does anybody know what glucose does if it just floats freely in the cytoplasm? Bad things, exactly. So what ends up happening is you have to make it into something else. So you'll make it into glycogen, you'll make it into adipose via a bunch of intermediate steps in the chemistry. The key one I'm gonna talk about is de novo lipogenesis. Fancy for we're gonna make new fat, right? You're well fed, you have enough ATP, you have enough glycogen if you're a glycogen storing cell and now you gotta make some fat. But the issue is you can only make fat so fast, right? I'm gonna make up numbers now. You can make adipose at a rate of 10 I don't cares per hour. Great. You can make fat at 10 I don't cares per hour but you have enough fuel in your body that you're gonna make 12. Okay, 10 gets put into fat, the two back up. What happens to those two that back up, right? Those two can't go into storage, they're left in flux. When you end up with that storage, with that excess, right? When the amount of fat to make exceeds the rate that you can synthesize, that's a signal to say to the actual like cell membrane, hey, I can't take no more fuel, slow the hell down, slow the heck down. I shouldn't swear here, slow down, slow down. And what ends up happening is you cannot take the glucose in, you cannot take the fat in, the protein, so on and so forth, they back up into the blood. What happens when glucose backs up into the blood? This isn't a med school lecture, I'm gonna fast forward. When blood sugar increases, the pancreas has to work harder. Pancreas secretes the insulin. The insulin, what, is it anabolic or catabolic signal? It's anabolic. So what ends up happening is you'll secrete enough insulin to overcome the insulin resistance that you want it to have. But in response, now the basal insulin in the body's up just because that's the price of doing business. And what does the liver do when insulin is high? Is it, again, anabolic or catabolic? That is anabolic. What does the liver do when fat, uh, sorry, when insulin is up? It itself goes into de novo lipogenesis, right? It's gonna make fat out of its own stores, et cetera, et cetera. And it can do that for a while. It's built to make glycogen. It's built to export fat. But at some point, right, repeat the process, it gets oversaturated and you just walk down the line. The muscle gets full first. Okay, the muscle sh uh, shunts that sugar over to the liver. The liver turns into fat, sends it to the adipose. The adipose says, hey, I'm built for this. I got you. It stores all that fat until it can't anymore because eventually it can't right? And then it begins to spill back out. What happens when a fat cell becomes insulin resistant? When the adipose has so much fuel in itself that it cannot keep up either, now it blunts the insulin signal. The pancreas secretes more, but it can't see it. Adipose is insulin blind because of the resistant pattern. What is it going to do? It's going to go catabolic. It's going to release its stored uh, metabolites back into the blood. That means what? Free fatty acids, triglycerides are going to bump up, right? transports that to the liver. Liver does its job. It's going to say, hey, look at all this fat. Look at all this stuff. I'm going to put it into storage, but here's the problem. The liver ain't a storage organ for fat, so what does it do? It just kind of lands wherever. You get ectopic fat deposition, hopefully in the liver, because it can technically kind of handle that, but it really it's going to go anywhere in the viscera, which is how we end up with that central obesity. Cool. That's like the recap version. We're good with that? Just making sure. I see her nodding, so I'm going to move on. This is the schematic for it. This is the engine, right? You have liver... Uh, muscle, fat, 
kind of dancing around each other, trying to juggle this excess fuel. And you can only juggle so long before you get tired. Does anybody here juggle? Neither do I. It's okay. Visceral fat. Visceral fat. Obese, non-obese. Notice that the scenario doesn't care, right? You end up with this ectopic fat deposition into the viscera, regardless of your subcutaneous fat, you end up with problems. Why is it a problem to have fat deposition in the, uh, in the viscera? That, that's rhetorical. I know you guys don't have mics. I just want you to think about that for a second, especially the virtual guys, because I want to keep you all awake. What is the problem with fat in the viscera? Right? You have to remember fat isn't, doesn't, doesn't belong there. It's not registered as a thing that's supposed to be. What happens when things that aren't supposed to be in places in the body are in places in the body? The body gets angry. Non-metaphorically, what happens is you activate the, the, uh, the immune system, the macrophages, things like that. What ends up happening is fat in the viscera, fat in the liver, let's get specific, triggers the Kupfer cells. That's the macrophages that guard the liver. And it says, what the heck are you doing here? Why are you here? It registers that as an invader, an attacker. So it attacks it. And how does the macrophage attack? It does a what? An oxidative burst, right? It takes the peroxide that it built up in its system and goes, yo, fat, get out of here. Dumps that on it. Because the idea is if it's bacteria and you dump, what? You dump peroxide on bacteria, it dies. Good. But fat don't die. It's not, it's, it's, it's fat. You dumped an oxidative burst onto fuel. What do you think is going to happen? You end up with increased inflammation. Back to those slides. And you can do that for a little bit. You can always repair, especially if you back off a little bit and just give it time to recover. But what happens if you hit it again and again and again and again? What ends up happening is eventually the inflammation becomes so significant, you end up with fibrosis. That NAFLD turned to NASH. That NASH turns into cirrhosis. I'm using that as an example. What happens if it happens into a kidney, into a pancreas, et cetera, et cetera? This is the thing that drives a lot of the common variant of what obesity, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera. It's not a disease in the formal sense. It's the body's adaptive, now maladaptive process to just being too damn fed or too underactive. Now you can just say eat less, move more, but that seems to not work nearly as well as we want it to. It works for a lot, but not for everyone. And it's our job with the docs, right? We got to be able to handle those people who get left behind. What do we do with that? Let's talk about treatment. Questions so far? If there are questions, I'll repeat it for virtual folks. It's okay if there aren't. We're good to continue. I see like one, two, three, four, five nods. Let's go. Cool. So let's get osteopathic real quick because it's that kind of conference. Um, I'm not going to read the four tenets to y'all, but I want to focus on the last one. I'm going to slow down for this last one. A rational treatment plan is built off of an understanding of the mechanism, right? Y'all know how the heart works. If I talk about a Frank Starling mechanism, right? If I talk about the way that the, uh, the blood works, uh, volume and the stroke volume. Like if I talk about that type of stuff, you guys know what to do with beta blockers. You guys know what to do with hypertensive medications. You know how to protect a heart. We're talking about a metabolic phenomenon right now, so we have to understand that metabolic thing. The run through I gave you all was just to make sure we're all on the same page for the fun stuff. This is the fun stuff. If the problem is that the system is overfed and underactive, then the solution ought to be some sort of inverse. We need to strip the excess whether that's by feeding it less or by burning more, I don't technically care at this phase, but some version of get the excess out is the only solution, right? You can only juggle for so long. That's the metaphor I want to hold you, uh, hold you guys to, right? You can, how long can you bounce these metabolites around before they begin to go into the wrong place? How long before you start dropping balls into the wrong place? Reduce the overall insulin secretion, stop the resistance pattern. If you look at any of the dietary strategies, any of the medications, any of the interventions, there's nothing magical about them. Look at bariatrics, look at GLP-1s, look at what we do with the uh, cutting, even cutting calories, lowering the carbohydrates, cutting the whatever. They all, do, they all do this to some level, some better than others, some for different problems, right? You want to just cut the calories, rock on, cut the calories. You want to cut the carbs, great, you'll drop the insulin. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, doesn't matter. You find what works and you go on from there. The reason I'm introducing fasting isn't to replace any of those strategies that you guys already use in clinic. It's to give you guys um, a tool to put into your toolkit, right? This is a sincere question, so I hope I at least get one raised, raised hand somewhere, okay? Um, within your practice practices, how many of y'all feel comfortable uh, talking about just cutting calories, like eat healthier? lower the load. If you're eating like Whataburger triples three times a day, cut it down to two. How comfortable are you guys with cutting calories as an intervention for a patient? Is anybody not? I see one hand raised for, for the yes, I assume. Yes? Just making sure. Cool. I see a couple head nods. Good. 
How many of y'all are clinically integrating the carb reduction? I don't necessarily mean keto, you can do that too. But just the idea that, hey, for this kind of problem, especially if we're talking the diabetic variant, cutting the carbohydrates is productive. Anybody? Good, good, good. And then um, I feel like I'm preaching to a choir here. Everybody understands ultra processed foods is a problem, I'm assuming, yes? Cool, not a biochem lecture, I'm not gonna dig into the chemistry. If y'all aren't familiar, eh, talk to me afterwards. But basically, yeah, if you had one move from a hypertension standpoint and you decide to cut out the ultra processed food, does anybody know how much sodium you cut just by cutting the box stuff? We actually have statistics on this one because we talk about cutting sodium, right? How much sodium can you drop by cutting out the box stuff? Average American, average American, median income, not Texan, they're special. Cool. It's about 80%, 70 to 80, depending on, but again, that's for median, right? And that's a big deal because you talk about cutting sodium. Anyway, point being, you guys know how to do that, great. And you all know how to talk about exercise. I don't care if it's cardio, strength training, something in between, have fun. Again, this is meant to augment those moves. Now let's talk about manipulating the feed. That's really what that first option is, right? Manipulating the demand, right? Or manipulating the timing, that's the star for today. So let's talk about how to fast. Let's talk about what it is, first of all. I'm gonna give some historical context because we gotta know how the human body runs to some degree. Once upon a time, we didn't always have uh, farmland. We didn't always have stability. We didn't always have grain. That's not a bad thing um, that we have grain, but I just want to make context. Like we didn't always have food stability. And the good thing about our species is we were able to operate without food for longer than expected, right? There's feast, there's famine, the hunt is good, the harvest is good, whatever. Make your metaphor, make an idyllic past, have fun with it. But the point being is sometimes hard times happen and we don't just die for not eating a couple meals in a day. And that's a big deal because that means that our species is capable of not going two, three, four days at a time without food because it happened and we made it here, which means congratulations, you made it here. You can afford to not eat for a minute. I say that because not every animal, not every, uh, even not, a, not every primate can do that. Try doing this to a capuchin, they're gonna die. Don't do that to a capuchin. But you get the idea. Not every species can run the system. Turns out we're one of the ones that can. The idea is that by virtue of making it this far, knowing that we had feast and famine cycles, somehow or another we had to develop the apparatus to handle famine. Right? And then there's a couple logical jumps to make. I'm not gonna make all of them for you because some of them are kind of weird, I'm not gonna lie. But the idea is that if our system was designed to handle periods of famine, is it possible that we were designed to thrive with, again, intermittent periods of famine? That's the hypothesis. Don't know if it's true or not. Not gonna go that far because I don't necessarily know. But at least that, that's the idea that led to this uh, hypothesis. But you look at what humans have done in the past and some version of a fast has been integrated into almost every culture, which is a big deal, because that's a feasibility discussion, right? If every culture in some fashion has a fasting behavior, I don't care if it's a short fast, long fast, a meat only, a fish only, eat literally nothing, the fact that it persists and occurs spontaneously in so many different environments um, that don't communicate together in this timeline imply that there's something to it. It's not just technically compatible, it is apparently feasible within a society. That's a big deal. Because the question becomes, okay, fine, it's feasible, it's compatible, is it useful? Because you could be feasible, compatible, and completely useless. There's nothing wrong with that. We call those spandrels, right? But is this useful? So let's fast forward. Let's get out of like uh, swords and sandals. If we look at 2019 plus, that was the question a lot of the big wigs tried to figure out appropriately, like New England Journal of Medicine, American Heart Association, ADA, they go, is there something useful to this strategy? Is it just another cute fad thing? Or is it something worth uh, investing in cognitive space, right? Um, 2019, December 26th, it was like a birth, it was like a Christmas gift to me. New England drops a journal article talking about this big review saying that, hey, we took a look at this fasting game, this intermittent fasting thing, and there's something to it. We don't know how to use it yet. We don't know how to dose it. We don't know how to really track the outcomes appropriately. But by the, the disease-oriented evidence, by the physiology, this should do something good. That's a big deal. Fast forward, we all have the green light to do some literature stuff, research and all that good stuff. We're looking at AHA and ADA. By the time 2022 kicks in, which is now, so 2021 kicks in, they're starting to back it. Now, if these two are backing it, that's a big deal. Because they're not, it's not some no-name organization. These are the ones that govern a lot of how we think in, the, in, our, in our space, right? So the question becomes, what, what made these guys say yes? We're gonna talk about three different regimens, um, time-restricted eating, okay? 
that's the one where it's kind of like skip breakfast. Or really what you say is there's a 16-hour window where you're not going to eat. There's an eight-hour or maybe six or maybe four where you do eat. Get all your calories in within this narrow space instead of three meals a day. Something a bit more intense is the alternate day fasting. Basically, pick Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? You eat Monday, skip Tuesday. Eat Wednesday, skip Thursday. Repeat, repeat. You don't have to think too much. If you ate yesterday, don't eat today. And then repeat. Then there's the 5-2, which kind of broke up into two variants. There's the 5-2 complete fast, where it's like five, pick two non-consecutive days in the week and just don't eat nothing. And then there's the variant where it's like eat less, significant, like 300 calories less. Like you eat maybe 2,500, 2,700 on a Monday, Tuesday, uh, on Monday, Wednesday. But on that Tuesday, you're eating like two or three. Um, but again, those are kind of the ones that have been most extensively uh, researched. Uh, yes, ma'am. We have a question Ooh. from an, an audience member, a um, virtual audience member. Go for it. Uh, in the beginning of a fasting regimen, many of my patients get entrapped in the initial glycemic slump or hyper, hypoglycemic slump and turn to a sweet or some form of refined sugar, which of course makes the situation worse. And then they ultimately drop off of the program. Do you have any suggestions to help them avoid that first step? Absolutely. Um, Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I actually, I'm hoping I sent you the right version of this PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to address that explicitly closer to the end. There's a phase where I'm going to talk about clinical application and troubleshooting. That, that is one of the explicit one scenarios I want to run you guys by. So whoever asked that, I'll take care of you. Time restricted eating, alternate day fasting, and the 5-2. Those are the ones that are the most extensively uh, studied. That means from a clinician's perspective, these are the ones that you're most likely to have your patients stumble upon or if you take on the skill set, one of the ones that you're most likely to begin fasting, uh, begin uh, prescribing. There are other ways to do this. There are different diagnoses where this matter, but just as an intro course, right? I wouldn't recommend going past these three until you kind of have some, some work in the field with it. How does it work? Basically, our body does these things when you don't eat. It takes about 12 to 16 hours, depending on how much glycogen you have in store. Basically, if you, don't, if you do not eat, if there's no calorie intake, at some point you have to take what you have in reserve, that's your sub-Q, your viscera, and put it into production, right? When you do that, you're metabolizing primarily adipose, primarily fat. Because you're metabolizing primarily fat, certain things build up, for example, ketone bodies. It turns out the absence of glucose and the presence of ketones are very powerful triggers for your body to do various interesting things uh, the most important one that I'm going to mention is the AMPK system. Now, this is deep in the biochem turf, so I'm going to be very superficial with this. So for the ones who nerd out about this, um, like my colleagues who I know are listening, I apologize. This is the easy version. You have two broad metabolic switches. You have the AMPK system and the mTOR system. Basically, call it the AMPK. We'll call it the, the famine system and mTOR being the feast system, roughly corresponding to anabolic and catabolic. When you do not eat for 12 to 16 hours or more, the AMPK system boots in, boots up. What does that do? The AMPK system is responsible for recruiting energy stores. That's the easy part. It's also responsible for building up your capacity to metabolize in the state. For example, let's say you're, you can make ATP off of fat at a rate of X, okay? You keep AMPK running for a long time, quite a while, what ends up happening is you stimulate the body to make new mitochondria, better mitochondria, so you can metabolize fat at a rate of X with a multiplier, right? Let's say I'm this good at metabolizing fat and you're just a little good at it, but you do it for maybe a couple weeks, couple months, and all of a sudden you can do it real easy. Like that's not you adapting mentally necessarily. I mean, yeah, you gotta adapt to it mentally, but what's happening is at, the longer you spend in the AMPK system being activated, the more efficient your mitochondria become. That's part of the game. Um, you make more mitochondria, that's part of the game. You find the cells that don't work, you find the proteins that don't work, and you recycle them for fuel, which is a big deal because can you imagine a bunch of gunked up old cells in your, uh, sorry, organelles in your cell not doing their job? Something has to say, we gotta get rid of these guys, and turns out the recycling, the, the, the quality control, the, uh, I don't like this, I'm firing it, part of our body doesn't operate until we're in that mode for quite some time. I contrast that to the mTOR system, which is the build it up phase, right? Um, there's fuel, there's protein, you're satisfied, you're rested, good for you, there's insulin secreted. That's the time to rebuild, make stuff, right? And the idea is by cyclically running a feast and famine cycle, you 
take away the things you don't need and you harden them, you make them resilient, and then during the feed phase, this is the important part, during the feed phase, you build them back up, right? What you end up with is a body that's tuned, more efficient. It's adapted to this process. It turns out that is clinically useful for us. The process of tuning the body forces a couple things to happen. You drop the glycogen, you increase ketones, like I said, you increase insulin sensitivity, which makes sense if you think about that, right? You're stripping down all this excess fuel. You gotta train the body to be able to accept fuel rapidly then because there's not much, enough going on. Likewise, the intestines become more motile because it has to process whatever the hell you're gonna put in later on. You reduce the inflammation because a lot of the processes, again, the cost of doing labor type of stuff are going down so you're not as metabolically active as you were, which means you're not making as much stuff, which means a lot less waste products, good for you. The brain gets sharper, and that's a cool thing. That was one of the ones that was really interesting about this phenomenon. When I first stumbled upon this literature, it was for neurocognitive work, like epilepsy, uh, dementia, specifically Alzheimer's. I didn't know it as a metabolic game. I learned it as a cognitive boost, basically. There's a difference between going without food for a couple days versus a couple weeks, a couple days. Who here has been hangry? Awesome. Now, I want you to imagine real quick, instead of just being hangry in an office space, okay, um, let's, let's, get us out of, let's get us out of white coat, let's get us out of cubicles and whatnot. You haven't eaten in a minute. You're hungry. Like hungry, like angry hungry. Are you gonna go find some damn food? Is that a hard thing to do if you don't have, what's the, Kroger, if you don't have groceries around? Like, if, let's say you had to go hunt and forage do you think that aggression is productive for you? Does that make sense? There's an energy boost, there's an adrenaline dump that happens roughly, I'm saying this from experience, about at the 24 to 36 hour mark without food. And that adrenaline dump, if it doesn't have an outlet, you call that hangry. Like the commercial, eat a Snickers, that whole thing, right? However, if that's goal directed, right? If you're using that aggression, if you're using that adrenaline kick to do something productive, that's a cognitive boon. You're sharper technically for it. And if you know how to channel that energy into something productive, rock on. You are technically smarter. Last lecture, the guy mentioned BDNF. You secrete more BDNF during this phase because let's pretend you're foraging for food and you find a food source. You want to prime the body to be able to remember that food source, right? So what ends up happening is you have cognitive and memory enhancements at the 24 to 38, 36 hour threshold, which is pretty dope. That being said, if you do this for too long, go five, six days, seven days, don't do that, without eating, that boost only lasts you so long, right? You use that cognitive energy boost, kick, whatever, to find food, but if the food isn't found, now the body begins to shut down. We gotta stay away from that. Hence, you can only fast for so, so long before you have to feed. You can't just go off nothing. I just wanna make that very clear. Any new questions coming up on virtual side? Just making sure, all right. This is the visual metaphor I talk to my patients about, separating wheat from chaff, resilience, hardening, really cool like blacksmithy metal stuff. But the idea is, again, when you deliberately fast, you're putting your body in a situation where it's introspective. It's looking for what is no longer up to snuff. What can I separate from? What can I recycle as fuel to save the rest of me? And then when you refeed, you really build up those, those parts of you that are worthy of being kept. The dead mitochondria go. That's a big deal. Because a lot of the energy fatigue issues are because the mitochondria can't handle. Think about um, all the glyco glycolytic damage. Think about all the oxidative damage, et cetera. And think about if you never, ever got rid of them. How much, cell, how much damage accumulates? How many processes break down? That's technically called aging, right? Awesome. You guys are understanding me? Awesome. Let's talk about the evidence to make this productive because I can talk to you about theoreticals and it doesn't matter. You guys are better than that. So let's talk about when this works. We seem to know that it is non-inferior to calorie restriction. And you're like, that doesn't sound really good in marketing, does it? But you think about that, we know calorie restriction works if you can handle it, right? If you can handle it, it rocks. But not everybody can handle it, which means it's not inferior, which means it's a solid alternative, which means, hey, by the way, you have an option too. In terms of metabolic syndrome, as in if you isocalorically, as in let's say 2,000 calorie diet here, 2,000 calorie diet here, this guy eats three meals and a snack, this guy eats like one big meal and like, I don't know, a thing before bed or something like that, right? Let's say an eating window of 16 hours versus an eating window of four hours. Same food, same calorie, same everything else. The four hour window, just because of what it did, will produce a metabolic benefit. The blood pressure is gonna drop, the lipids are gonna change for the better, the sugars improve expectedly, right? That being said, in terms of hypertension, it seems to be superior, which is really cool. 
Now the question is why? Because you would think like, wait, hold on. I'm adding adrenaline and cortisol to the system. How the hell will my blood pressure get better? That would be a good question for my physio nerds. But it turns out, um, how many of y'all remember your insulin physio from back in the day? It's okay if you don't. Um, one of the things that's important to note is that insulin's a vasodilator. It's a big deal, actually. Because if insulin is meant to vasodilate and you become insulin resistant, you lose that vasodilatory capacity. And the act of returning that sensitivity to the body lets insulin do its job appropriately. It turns out by just, just the checks and balances of how the system runs, isocaloric, the fast seems to be superior to calorie restriction in specifically hypertension terms for about 10 points, which is again, pretty, pretty cool. It's an alternative to the keto diet for diabetes. And uh, we talked about, I, I alluded to it. We, do, we go into nutritional ketosis. We take the body out of uh, metabolizing glucose. We go into ketosis and that's on purpose. And there's other ways to do that. For example, the keto diet. And the keto diet is as much as I like it for some patients is not for everybody. Whether that be, a, be for a financial, for cardiac or GI concerns. Even if, let's say, let's say in an isolated one variable setting, the diabetic patients goes on keto, the diabetes will get better. But they have no gallbladder. I want you to feed the guy with no gallbladder 30 avocados, see what happens. Do you understand me? Awesome, don't do that. So for those patients who should be in nutritional ketosis who cannot do a keto diet, this is another way to get into that system. And then this is actually my favorite slide deck here. This is the one that like resonates with me like, hey, I'm a doctor, I should care about this stuff. This is the slide I care about. That's a signal to pay attention for those who are falling asleep on virtual. This was a case series, three patients. And three's not a lot, but it proves a concept. It shows a concept. They took some 20 year guys with diabetes and they put them on variations of a fast. They, they write it here, three days a week, three days a week, alternate day. And it, just by doing that, they, these guys did it for a year. And here were their outcomes. The A1C for guy one went from a 10 to a seven point something or other. This one went from a 6.3 down to a 6.17 6 or something like that. Those results aren't that impressive. Like that should not impress you. If it did, raise your expectations. The thing that made me care, the thing that made me like, what about this was down here. I want you to look at their med lists. Patient one, insulin glarging, 58 units, with uh, insulin aspart, 22 units. Does anybody know canagliflozin in Volcana? Can I say that here? Okay. Metformin, insulin Lispro, metformin insulin. Okay. These are all type two diabetic patients with insulin, significant amounts of it. All of these patients got off their insulin. That's exciting. More importantly, Two of those three patients got off their insulin in the first month. One of them, I believe the one who was on bolus, got off in the first five days. And that was sustained over the year. So even though the A1C shift was not that big of a deal, I want you to consider the med burden reduction. Now, uh, let's talk about cognitive biases in a good way. My understanding is everybody in this room is a DO, is that correct? That, that's not like a judge. I'm just, I'm assuming, I, I would never ask, you know what I mean? I'm assuming we're all DOs, we're all osteopaths, we all flew the AT still flag at some point. Most of us have an anti-med bias, not because of anything uh, fundamentally wrong about med, but because we believe in that body's ability to heal itself, caveat, when given the chance. Do you see what I'm building at? Awesome. Given the opportunity, right, to strip out these resources, let the body fast and so on and so forth, many, but not all of your patients will reduce their med load, some by dramatic amounts like these guys. I keep a census in my, own, in my own clinic for how many patients I'm doing this with. I have 88 on my current panel for this specifically on top of my general practice. Of the 88, it's been about since July, so five plus two. It's been seven months since my cohort from uh, July. Of the 88, 16 of them as of yesterday are off their meds, which is like humblingly dope. Like I didn't do, I just told them to do this and good for them, you know what I mean? They're calling me at like, middle of the night, like my sugars are in the 50s. I'm like, get off the damn insulin because they don't need it anymore, which is the point of our job half the time. For a specific disease process, it is superior. For NAFLD specifically, progressing to NASH and cirrhosis. Yes. What if low BS triggers migraine and how can you fast? Also going to get there. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip to the solution because that's an easy enough one. Basically, a lot of the migraine headache phenomenon that occur in the beginning of a fast, one, in about a month or two, they will go away as the fluid balance shifts. That being said, a lot of that is from the aggressive diuresis that happens as a price of doing this intervention. A lot of that can be mitigated if the patient can handle caffeine, let them use caffeine, it's okay. Um, the alternative is actually salt supplementation. Because of how much sodium they're gonna dump doing this, so a lot of patients will actually need some salt, especially in the beginning phase, to mitigate that exact phenomenon. These are good questions. This is more advanced than I thought it would be. But yeah, for uh, halting progression to NASH and cirrhosis, this seems to be superior to standard of care. Standard of care in this study was defined as the, um, the calorie reduction, the healthy eating pattern, so on and so forth. Very good stuff cardiovascular. I'm not going to knock that. But if we're talking about specific disease processes, right, I'm kind of A on the cardio for today, but I really care about this soon-to-be cirrhotic liver. I'm going to run this move first, and when they finish, graduate them back into something a bit more moderate, if necessary. And then from the longevity perspective, this seems to be, again, it's all the same metabolic benefits as calorie restriction, but here's the kicker. It's better tolerated in a lot of patients. Not everybody can handle cutting calories. Let's say, for example, you eat 3,500 calories a day, basically two Whataburgers and some soda. You can, I really like Whataburger, I apologize. You cut out 500 calories, they can probably hack it. But you take that same goal, 500 calorie reduction, but you take that to somebody who's eating 1,700 calories a day. It'll be tougher, but they could do it. What if they're eating 1,200 already? And you're like, there's no way you're eating 1,200. They bring you the food log and you're like, dude, you only eat 1,200 calories, what the heck? Can you cut 500 for them productively? Technically, it can, but now you run the risk of malnutrition outside of weight loss, right? This is your alternative. At the same time, one of the, alternative, one of the benefits of this one is when you go completely zero calorie, you will get hungry. I'm not going to BS you guys about that. However, after that first 24 hours kicks in, I don't know if you guys have ever done this yourselves, the hunger begins to abate significantly. So you go from, I'm well fed, I'm good, I'm kind of hungry, I'm really hungry. Where'd the hunger go? And then you'll cycle it back between really hungry and not hungry at an interval, but it never gets worse than that, which is a big deal because if your patients go, hey, you're allowed to feel hungry, you're gonna live, give it a couple hours, they'll go away, and then you'll feel hungry again, don't freak out, that's, that's, that's hormone stuff. And you give them that permission to be hungry, that's a big deal in this country, the permission to be hungry. Then they go, do I have to worry about this? And you're like, not nah, unless you got these side effects. And you're like, hey, here's a side effect list, here's the interventions. Drops in blood pressure, drop in diastolic blood. The heart rate will go up a little bit. Expect that. This is a change in cholesterol, change in HDL. I, I realize that the structure of the graph is a little bit sloppy, so I'm going to focus on the part that's important. You're going to mobilize fat stores, which means your LDL may go up or down, but your triglycerides will typically um, go up in the initial phase and then down as you run out. As in, it's probably not a good time to check the lipids in the first six weeks when you do this. You will see some scary things. It's okay. That being said, they should normalize and the net effect should go down. But expect this as an acute phase reaction. Expect this in the first two to six weeks and be okay with that. Again, assuming that they can handle that. Don't do this to the per... Ooh, which is what I just do. I touched my mic. Never mind, we're good. Don't do this to somebody with a trigs of 500. Okay. Now, I focus on metabolic disease because that's the big star of the shoe. Yes? Next question, are you augmenting with GLP-1 RA medications? I love whoever asked that question. Yes, 100%. Uh, the GLP-1 is a decent um, hunger suppressant. It also augments the speed of what we're doing here. It has liver protective uh, aspects to it. At the same time, part of the magic about GLP-1s is they increase insulin secretion only in the presence of sufficient sugar, which means when you do eat, you get that extra boost to keep the sugars down, but when you don't eat, it basically does nothing from a sugar perspective, but it seems to do a lot of good for the heart. And because these guys are heart risk patients, hell yeah, I like GLP ones a lot. Am I allowed to say brand name stuff here? Awesome. Um, I tend to use a lot of Trulicity and a lot of Victoza. Sexenda is the one that got approved for obesity. It's dope, but getting that approved for my patients is hard. So clinically, I, I made a lot of use of Trulicity, specifically uh, in the 3.0 once weekly and the 4.5 once weekly doses. If they can build up to that, it suppresses the hunger enough that if they need to be doing this, it makes it a hell of a lot easier. That being said, if they eat a lot, they will get a bloated stomach. That's kind of what you're teaching them to avoid anyway. 
Now, again, I introduced this, this, this intervention in the context of uh, metabolic syndrome, but it's for other things. The evidence is supporting its utility in rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, um, a couple days before this presentation, I was looking at the American College of Rheumatology. They're starting to back the use of long fasting, like the three, four day plus fasting. Don't do that first. As an intervention to calm down um, RA, as in like less disease burden, less inflammation, better outcomes, better pain profiles. Um, I do that a couple times in my osteopath, in my OMM clinic, not so much my FM practice. I'll have folks with uh, various versions of RA or DISH syndrome who come in like, hey doc, I tried everything, I got nothing. Hey, don't eat for three days, see what happens. And they're like, what the hell do you mean? And I'm like, trust me. And then they come back and they're like, doc, that actually felt better. Cool, cool, Whew, don't sue me. And then um, the other one is for MS, for a similar pathophys. It seems that the anti-inflammatory and that recycling, that AMPK phenomenon I told you about, it's not just about uh, fat, guys. It's about changing the cells that I, again, I must emphasize that aren't worth keeping as in the ones that are causing you damage or the ones that are burned. So again, throw out what's not working, rebuild what is, repeat, repeat. A lot of these autoimmune conditions seem to meaningfully improve. It's not as dramatic as coming off all their meds, right? If you need um, HCQ to run your lupus, you might not come off that, but you'll be in a hell of a lot less pain. The quality of life seems to get better. Again, for those that can tolerate it. I'm seeing in oncology literature, it's becoming part of some of the uh, chemo and RADS uh, protocols. Because it turns out if you starve cancer cells, they die because they don't have a backup fuel system. The, at least the majority don't, right? Most of, your onco most of your oncotic cells need glucose metabolism to run. And when you say, hey, guess what? Your blood sugars are in the 40s. They just have a panic attack and die on themselves. Then you turn on a bunch of like apoptotic things and good stuff happens. But when you dose that with chemo, it looks like one, the chemo is better tolerated. They need less meds. And that's a good thing because meds are expensive. And let's be real, meds hurt. In that disease process, you want to reduce the med burden as much as possible to do the job, but you want to give them enough to do the job. This lets you be better at fighting, which is nice. And then, like I said, my intro to this phenomenon was, at, was cognitive work. So Alzheimer's was where I learned about this. And same thing, give it a day or two without food. The, the, mind, the mind will sharpen, but you don't go beyond that necessarily from a cognitive perspective. But notice, there's a lot of utility to this tool. Again, implying that this was something that the body is well calibrated for. All right, now this is where the questions become uh, addressed. Let's talk practical application stuff. Here, just make sure I got the right slide decks. Sweet, okay, just making sure. All right, so practical stuff. Who should do this? Basically, technically anybody, but no, that, that's not precise enough for you guys. If you have metabolic syndrome, particularly diabetes, consider this. If you have inflammatory pathologies that you're concerned with, and you guys are trained enough to know that in the, both the broad and the specific sense, give me your fibro patients, your fatigue patients, give me your my everything hurts patients it's at least worth a discussion. I'm not gonna commit to that one because we don't have data in that sense, but it's worth a discussion and if they like it, rock on. Patients with comorbid inflammatory or, here's the big one, when they can't handle the more traditional moves, right? Doc, I tried everything. I'm doing the paleo thing, the keto thing, the, the, the whatever thing, I tried the beach, whatever, blah. Nothing's working and you're like, just try it. Because it might augment that. Doesn't mean replace that, right? So let's say, Doc, I'm running a 80 grams of carbs per day, 1600 calorie diet. I'm on the treadmill two hours a day and I have a job and a spouse who can cover me so I can do this sustainably. It's like an ideal patient, but it's not working. All right, uh, you know what? Try this instead. What do you mean instead? No, no, no. Keep doing everything you're doing, but add this to it. See if it makes a difference. It's a, it can be useful as an augmentation. Remember, tools in a toolkit. How often can you build? Does anybody work on cars? I don't work on cars. Just in case. You can't really do a lot with just one tool, right? You can do a lot with a knife, maybe a screwdriver, but eventually you need a hammer, you know what I mean? So as a set of tools to work together on a project, maybe that's useful for you, maybe not as a monotherapy. How do you prescribe it? Practically speaking, I'd start with something moderate, like, hey, guy, lady, skip breakfast, see what happens. Doc, I don't eat breakfast, good for you. Skip breakfast, and you find out, oh crap, they snack, and they're like, Doc, I tried to do it, and I just realized I have like 10 snacks a day. What do you mean you have 10 snacks a day? But it's because of all the times they spend just like grazing past something in the office space or whatever. You know what I mean? Or they're uh, unemployed and home, and all they do is like, they'll, they'll hang in the house, they'll do some chores, but because there's like a random pretzel there, they'll grab one or two. You know what I mean? You're formalizing the, this is the eating time, this is the don't eat time. They build that habit, they build that awareness, and then you tighten that window more and more and more up to tolerance. What's the minimum dose for clinical utility? You want to be about 16 hours to be productive, you know what I mean? 
Because any less than that, you're basically doing the same thing. Uh, tighter than that, it's better technically if they can handle it, but you want at least that 16 hour to eight hour, fa uh, 16 hours fasted to eight hours fed to begin exploiting some of these properties for the sake of your patients. And then you build them up to the dose that's appropriate. If it's just weight loss or preventive work, you know what, that 16-8 might be good enough for you. But let's say, yo, diabetes, yo, NAFLD, right? You might want to take it up. Like, hey, you got the right habit. Now let's build you up to the full thing. The same way you were taught to do uh, the 16-8, because you have these problems, because you're on these meds, the data suggests that you should be at this dose if the plan is to get off it. If you're just like, hey, doc, I like it here. I don't want to get any sicker, but I'm good here. Hey, you can maybe hover in that. But if you're going for a reversal phase, you tend to need to use alternate day and five twos, if not the longer, uh, harsher regimens. I mean, harsher because of the side effects that uh, Jill was kind enough to mention from the virtual folks. These are the side effects. Embrace them. Hunger and cravings, that's kind of a no-brainer here. You're teaching somebody who's eaten three meals and snacks to not eat. They're gonna get habitual hunger, as in like trained hunger, right? It's lunchtime, I should be eating. Now you shouldn't, are you hungry? No? Why are you eating? Because I feel like eating. Why you feel like eating? This is what I do, doc. Okay, stop that. You know what I mean? That's okay. And then that's the craving side. And then proper hunger. Especially if you go into the 5 2 and alternate day, you will, they will feel hunger. You will feel hunger. But you got to make them differentiate the bad hunger from the good. It's okay. What's up? I've got a couple of questions. Three, so we can. Let's do it. Let's do it. Want. Okay. First question Do you have opinion or data on Dr. V. Longo's longevity diet or fasting mimicking? Um, on the fasting mimicking, yes. On the specific individual, I don't know it as well. Regarding the fasting mimicking thing, if it's purely a weight loss conversation uh, or a metabolic syndrome one, it's absolutely appropriate. If you're going for the oncogenic slash dermatologic uh, application, it's not calibrated for that. Again, there's a difference between cutting calories with tolerance, which is what the fasting mimicking is, versus exploiting the AMPK phenomenon, which requires, unfortunately, zero cal proper. Great. Next question. Do you have any uh, an opinion or any data on envi environmental toxins, obesogens? Um, technically, yes, but way beyond the scope of this particular discussion. I would love to talk about that. Just not here, unfortunately. Do you have a, a favorite sweetener? Is stevia okay? I tend to like stevia. Um, from a cost effectiveness standpoint and from a satisfactory to most patients with a palate standpoint, they see, it seems to be the best tolerated. Erythritol is cheap and available, but that cooling effect, the alcohol component, tends to put off a lot of people. And I forget what some of the other ones are out there, like monk fruit and whatnot, but they tend to have some GI distress at the doses a lot of my patients want them in. Stevia seems to be the one that my patients have taught me is preferred. Okay. Uh, can the, the fasting be applied to overweight children or adolescents without affecting growth or school performance? We got to get real specific there. That, that requires specificity. I tend to not recommend kids fast. Like if you're still in the growth phase because of your age, I'd rather run like a ketogenic thing or a plant-based thing or a calorie thing with exercise as opposed to a fast because of that phenomenon. If it's for um, cognitive things, maybe a 16-8, I can't really clinically or by the data justify more than that. Not from saying it's wrong, but because I, I just don't, that's, that's unknown turf now. Okay. Next question is the follow-up, um, reducing CNS BG levels and increasing CNS insulin levels. I, I missed the question part of that, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it was a follow-up of the initial, um, oh, the, it was the BG levels earlier. We'll see if we can get some more information okay. on that. Yeah, happy to answer, I just, I, I missed the, the, the question phase of the, of the statement. Um, but in the meantime, side effects. They will get hungry, deal with it. They will diurese. That's important because how many of your patients are on hydrochlorothiazide? How many patients are on Lasix? And this will be a potent diuretic over the first 24 hours. They will pee like damn, um, both salt and water. So that's something to be mindful of. It will produce migraines if you don't account for that. So a lot of my patients in the initial phase, I tell them overhydrate. It's okay to have some caffeine as long as it's non-caloric and consider, consider, don't have to do it, but consider uh, supplementing some salt, like a teaspoon in the day or something um, for the first maybe week or so just to mitigate the symptoms if and when they occur. Okay, and I think this is the first question and then it was the follow-up. Um, questions and thoughts on fasting effects on CNS, amyloid reduction, amyloid clearance, and oh, documented course. cognitive and behavioral improvement. That's the literature that got me interested in this in the first place. Like I said, my intro to this was in Alzheimer's literature, not in uh, metabolic disease. Um, there are some folks 
who want to play with Alzheimer's being renamed as diabetes type 3, which is kind of cute. I don't know if I agree with that, but it conveys a message. It conveys that there's something to it. Okay, and then last question for the moment. Are, you rec do, are there any recommendations in the macro distribution of average people? Um, the honest answer is no, because that has, I kind of homebrew a lot of my diets with my patients because that's the match their demand. If you're doing literally nothing, like if you're sedentary, I tend to not care. Uh, because you can kind of eat whatever makes sense as long as you're getting what you want. Once we get into the performance and sports med characteristics, I'll get more specific. For example, my athletes tend to require carb versus fat distributions relevant to their training and their professions. The only thing I'm going to say is I do prefer a heavy protein load for people who fast because of the rebuild phase, but I can't give numbers unless I have like demand uh, requirements, like give me an athlete, give me a sedentary guy, give me a military guy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, really cool type of discussion for after the lecture. Digestive issues, because, oh, yes, ma'am. That was the answer to the one of the questions addressed earlier, actually. Um, if necessary, or to mitigate symptoms in somebody with a large med burden, I'll recommend like a, cat, like a carb wean to get them into ketosis first and then graduate them to this. Um, yeah, the fat adapt adaptation is clinically useful. So I don't do it all the time, especially if it's more of like a hypertension thing. But if it's for my diabetic patients or my obese ones, I'll often like cut the carbs, not full blown keto, like maybe sub 80 grams Q daily. Um, and then I'll, as they adapt to that, switch the fasting window into them from there. Yeah, it takes about two weeks, three weeks from what I'm seeing. Yes, sir. If we're talking straight black with nothing inside it but your sad soul, then nah, it's fine. Um, I tend to recommend black coffee, tea, and water. Uh, the caffeine effect, again, is productive for this. It mitigates that hunger. It mitigates the, the migraines. At the same time, it's worth noting that if we're talking about NAFLD specifically, which a lot of these patients have, right, the prevalence of fatty liver disease in your diabetic patients is about 80%. It has liver protective effects. So if they can tolerate it, if they like it, I'll let them keep their coffee. I'll even encourage it. If they're not already coffee drinkers, I won't necessarily go out of my way to say, go drink some coffee. Does that address your question, sir? Lovely. Thank you, sir. Irritability. Like I said, they're going to be hangry. Account for it. Tell them to do something productive with it. Go train or something. The fatigue is possible because there is that phase as, I don't know lady with the hair's name, uh, um, the one who asked me about fat adaptation. She asked me a question about, do I do the Jason Fung uh, fat adapt thing before the fasting thing? Um, if fatigue is the pre prevalence uh, side effect, yeah, I'll pull them off the fast. I'll teach them how to maintain isocaloric and change the nutrient profile first, go up on their fat and protein or just the fat, cut the carbs down, and then switch them to the fast if the fatigue is too much. And then the altered sleep pattern. Uh, keep in mind, there is a cortisol and an adrenaline kick their moods are gonna get weird. Not necessarily in a good or bad way, just expect disturbances. You may need to adjust their psych meds, and that's okay, you kinda of want that. Just know that sleep patterns may change for better or for worse, just watch out for that. These are the meds that you have to be careful about. The obvious ones are first, please don't give somebody not eating three days bolus insulin, that's just a bad idea. There's no defense for that. But even basil uh, is safe, but you'll have to lower it um, to some degree. Uh, this isn't an insulin management lecture. It's a very worthy discussion. I just want to put this on your radar. Talk with your friendly neighborhood pharmacist to learn the details. But basically, if you're going to cut their food timing down that aggressively, please cut down their insulin to match. Same thing with their sulfonylureas and met metaglinides. Let's be real though, it's 2022. There's not a really good reason to have somebody on sulfonylurea unless they can't afford the other options, right? But look, man, I love you. I'm being kind in this lecture. <laughs> Honestly though, I have enough patients where it's that or nothing until they meet people with these options. So part of why I, inf I tend to push this fast so often is because that's their gateway off that medicine. Does that make sense? But until they run something like this, look, it doesn't increase mortality benefit, but if it keeps them out of the hospital because of like uh, a sugars in the 500s, it's worth something, but it's not a good option, all things considered, right? SGLT2s. I tend to like these meds a lot, but keep in mind, I just told you, you're going to pee like, whoa, please be careful with the medicine that makes you pee like, whoa, especially if they're hyperglycemic. How does an SGLT2 work? You dump salt, you dump water, you dump glucose. And I just told you, you're going to pee a lot of salt. 
you might not need as much of your Jardians or insert GL SGLT2 of choice. So consider a dose reduction or just temporarily hold to see if they even still need it. Antihypertensives and diuretics go without saying. Stimulant meds. One of the really fun things, like rewarding for me, is taking my young adults um, who meet me for metabolic disease off of their ADD meds because they do this. And they're like, Doc, I'm just angry and sharp. I'm like, have you considered weaning down the Adderall? And they're like, Doc, I need it. It's like, you're angry and focused. Do you really need this right now? And they're like, fine. Do you have an exam coming up? No. Give me two weeks. Cut it down for two weeks and see what happens. And they're like, Doc, I hate you, but fine. And then they do it. And they're like, huh. And you're like, are you still hangry? And they're like, no. Good for you. Get off the damn med. That's not frequent, but it's happened three times in my practice. And I was very proud of those kids, like sincerely, like good for them. I'm not going to say that that's like a thing to expect, but most of them need a dose adjustment. And those lucky three for me got off and I was like really proud of them. And then NSAIDs, if you're going to not eat, uh, you all know not to put NSAIDs in an empty stomach. This is not a resident lecture. You guys are smarter than that. Labs. These are useful. I like CMPs. I like insulins. The reason I like fasting insulin is because I need to know if they're resistant enough to matter. Because for example, what if you're overweight, obese, but you have no hyperinsulinemia? You can technically do whatever you want. Do I have to worry about you? But what if your obesity and your liver stuff implies that you are insulin resistant? We might need to be more careful, right? We use the CMP with the HGA1C fasting insulin to get a sense of how metabolically compromised they are. This is a sub-theme of my lecture, if you haven't noticed. I care a lot about livers, and I want to know if that liver is fatty. Because if that liver's fatty, I'm going to push for a harder fast, like a 5-2. Um, that being said, for all the patients I've screened for this, of that 88 cohort I mentioned, one of them was actually an autoimmune hepatitis that was missed. There was no reason to believe he had it. I'm like, he pops into my office, I grab the butterfly ultrasound, I pop it on his, you know, on his liver, and I'm like, hey, that looks cirrhotic, what the hell? And I'm like, you're 25, man, what happened? He goes, nothing. I'm like, give me, give me drugs, give me tattoo, give me something. He goes, I got nothing. I'm like... I got to talk to somebody. Call my friendly neighborhood GI doc. He's one floor up from me. And I'm like, look, man, I got a weird one. He works him up. Turns out it isn't actually an autoimmune hepatitis. I, he thought he was a metabolic guy. Technically, he is. But it's not like he was overfed and undernourished. He has hepatitis and his body can't process. Completely different treatment protocol. He doesn't have to do this stuff. But we found him. We got him to the right treatment. He's doing fine. Does that make sense? So I care about livers a lot if you guys haven't noticed. Monitoring. Do that especially if they're going to start doing a fast. I have a guy who's starting this Sunday. I told him to start Sunday, call my office, leave a message Saturday night, just so I know he's starting it officially. And I'm going to check with him first thing Monday. He's going to do a full 24 hours for the first bit, just to see how his body tolerates. Because the thing is, if the main phenomenon happened in the first 24 to 36 hour window, and he begins to diurese like, whoa, this dude's on like three antihypertensive meds. I'm going to have to cut that dose down in the morning. Same thing if they're going to be on insulin and stuff like that. So you don't let these guys go if they're on these high-risk medications. Um, how do you leverage that? Use your med students, use your nurses, your MAs. I don't care. Figure it out. It's your offices. I'm not going to tell you how to run your offices. But you want to watch these people closely until they're off the high-risk stuff, until you know they can handle it. The, the sickest guy I did this for, me and my, my ambulatory pharmacist and my nurses work on this guy every three days for about a week. No, sorry, two weeks. For about two weeks. But in those two weeks, he came off his insulin. He was on 50 of 2JO, 25 of Lisproke TID plus sliding scale. It's a lot of insulin. He went down to the 60s. He called me uh, two days after the 4th of July, like, Doc, my sugar's in the 60s, what do I do? I'm like, are you symptomatic? He goes, nah. I'm like, good, eat a peppermint, get off the damn insulin. But I wouldn't have known that if I waited till the office visit. God forbid, I'll see you in two weeks. In two weeks, find out you find out he's in your hospital or something like that, you know what I mean? So you watch these people closely. You can bill for it. We can do that now. It's 2022. You guys know that, right? We can bill for the time we spend with our different lecture, whatever. I'm going to end this with a brief uh, model story, whatever thing. And then I want to open up to any of the uh, bigger questions if there's any left. This is me. Like, this is actually me. Now, that being said, I want to make some caveats here. I don't have any liver disease. I don't have diabetes. I did this for camaraderie and solidarity with my patients. I slapped a CGM. It was the Libreview on myself. And I told uh, my patients I'm going to run the 5-2 strict with training. So what I did was I showed them my sugars. I let them see it, how my sugars operate as I implemented the fast, basically Thursdays when it started. And you can see that I was running in the 70s for quite some time. I even had some lows. You can see where that apple is there is when I decided to do something vaguely American. I went to Brahms and got uh, the triple with bacon. 
uh, a big thing of fries and I slammed down like a double scoop of ice cream. Not my normal eating pattern, but I wanted to see what my body would do with it. So I went from this to that, back down to this and so on and so forth. But this was me eating one meal a day. That was my one meal for the day, by the way. And notice, even though my sugars got low, I never got lower than a certain, like there's, there's like a wall I couldn't crack. And that's good to know. Same thing, there's no wall I could crack. I couldn't break below the 60s for some reason. And that's a good thing. You don't want to break below the 60s. I just want to let you know, as long as you have uh, a liver that functions, you can make enough glucose to make up the difference. By the way, that's why I care about livers. If the liver does not work, you cannot do gluconeogenesis, and that's a problem. Can you imagine why patients with sugars like this should not be on insulin? Good. Good. That was me refeeding a couple times. After a couple days into it, I'd have something small, something not too carb rich, and notice you can't even tell anymore. Like you don't know when I ate anymore. That was pretty cool. The reason I wanted to end on this one is some of my athletes, the ones I take care of. Um, both of those two disclose that I'm, they're okay with me telling some of the story. They both met me for various uh, metabolic phenomenon as their trainer, who happens to be their doctor. The first guy in the, this one, oh, this one here, the, the bald one, one of the strongest athletes I know, like just pound for pound. But he called me one day like, Doc, uh, my doctor said I have liver fat, whatever that means. And I'm like, oh, bro, get over here. Come to the house. So we had a long talk. We did the fasting thing. We did the keto thing first. He didn't handle the keto thing. Did the fast thing full speed. He went for like an alternate day setup. Uh, fast forward about six months and um, he got better. He, got, he, he didn't have to go on anything. I was very proud of him. He's a doc now. He's like proud of this stuff. Good for him. But he wanted to volunteer like, hey, tell them about me. I'm like, okay, cool. You got it, sir. Same thing with the guy who looks like me, but not quite me. No relation, I swear. Filipinos, I know. Tell me about it. But um, he came to me with uh, pre-diabetes and testosterone issues, similarly enough. And he goes, look, I don't want to be on these meds, man. Like, my career and my training need me to be off meds. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to do? He goes, tell me what to do, man. So I told him what to do. It was He ran a, a time-restricted eating with, like, a low-carb, non-ketogenic thing. Same thing. We gave it about six months. He fixed it up. He's like a like a like a amateur wrestler or whatever now, but um, yeah, they wanted to let uh, you guys know that they got better doing this, which is like that's not data, but fine. They're family to me, so they're like please bring those stories up. I'm like, God, you got it, fine. Why not? So those guys wanted to say hello to you guys to consider doing this to other guys and gals. Sounds good. Awesome. I do not know where I am for time, so I'm going to show the blank screen to imply that this lecture is over. If there's any questions, please toss them my way. I'm here until the snow melts, so just find me if you can't find me here. Do we got anything? Jill, we good? Uh, for any other questions that were submitted virtually that we haven't had a chance to uh, oh, shit, submit more. or announce, um, you are receiving emails of those questions, and okay. so we'll be sure for everybody to get answers to their questions. Awesome. Uh, last comment then, if there's no further questions, I want you to question literally everything I said, because who the hell am I to be speaking to you guys? Um, the slide deck that's part of the presentation that uh, Jill set up has my PowerPoint, and if you notice, there's a lot of slides with like green text in the data phase. The green text are hyperlinks directly to the papers that I'm citing. As Until we got to this phase, where I'm doing the personal story part, Nothing I said was unsightable. I kind of designed this spiel to be that way. Sir. I'll let my patients figure it out. Um, like me personally or what I'm talking about my patients? So me personally, I eat one meal a day. Um, followed by like a large snack. So like I'll do dinner with my family, I'll give it about an hour, half hour, get my exercise in after the kids go to bed, and then eat a secondary, not quite a meal, but like a heavy snack, and that'll be my setup until the next night. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that to people. It works well for my professionals, like doctors and whatnot, because of our work schedules and family lives. Um, but again, that's what I do, not necessarily what my patients have adapted for their own environments. The big thing is you want to adapt this to be feasible in their home, in their native environment. Thank you, sir. Good question. Anything else? I feel like I struck a nerve with some folks. I'm seeing like a lot of smiling and head nodding. Nobody's tried to pitchfork me yet. Be good, be good. I don't want to take that other person's time. Sign off? Signing off. All right.